Thanks very much, Philip. It's always nice to have clapping at the beginning because you never know what's going to happen at the end. Uh, as you've gathered, I'm quite old from that description, and my record as broadcast is quite chicken. But I'm thrilled to be here tonight. Um, I want to congratulate the RTS on the, its timing, which is impeccable on this. Also, that the fact they've got together the distinguished panel they have, um, and this is going to be a learning experience for me. And I don't think there could be three better people here tonight uh, to learn from. And on my immediate left is Alice Enders, who's Director of Research at Enders Analysis, which knows more about broadcasting than anybody else. Followed by David Elstein. Well, I don't know how to introduce him. He used to be the editor this week, but uh, did one or two things subsequently at Sky, at Channel 5. And he's been a broadcasting irritant and iconoclast for as many, as long as we can think. Always worth listening to. And uh, on the far left, and I don't make any political um, suggestions, there is Patrick Barweis, who is a uh, professor of the London Business School and also involved with the BLD on a number of occasions I've heard him speak. Now, we really should call this, why on earth would you want to be DG? <laughs> because when, uh, is there enough money in the world to pay you? But we won't ask that question. Uh, what we're going to try and do is to look at the intro, if you like, that the DG, the new DG, went upon his facing. And so we're going to do three things tonight, or I hope we're going to try and do three things. First of all is to look at that broad intro and the, the sort of timetable. Two, look then at the factors that come into play. And then three, be it political will, technological obstacles or opportunities, audience behavior. And then three, if we're lucky, um, find some, suggest some possible strategies for an incoming director general. But of course, that strategy will depend upon the politics and other things of the individual who are appointed, not to say the chairman. So uh, that's what we're going to try and do. And I will try at the end of each section to bring you in for questions. We're supposed to finish about an hour and a half, five minutes, but we might stretch it by a little more than that. So let's, let's, let's get ahead and, and look at what's uh, in coming up. I suppose the, the, the two things that are coming up, even perhaps before the DG is appointed, um, the new DG is appointed, is the decriminalization of people who don't pay the license fee, followed by, at the same time, the BBC uh, enforcing uh, the payment uh, of the license fee by some over 75s who have not previously paid it, which would be great fun. So those two things are there. The, uh, the new chairman will be appointed in 2022. The present chairman has been told he will not be reappointed. So there'll be a new chairman. So it's a paradox. And some people think that's why, of course, uh, Tony Hall has stood down a year before he wanted to do, so, wanted to, so that uh, the present chairman can appoint someone he wants in the job uh, before a new chairman comes. But of course, a new chairman could fire a new DG. So there we are. This is the, the, that. And then the charter itself ends in 2027. And we're about to go almost in, into a mid-term review of that. And then there's a thing which really slipped my attention. I'm just going to ask Alice about this for the beginning. Is that as a result of coming out of the European community, uh, we will no longer be part of the Eurovision Audio or responsive to the Eurovision Audio Visual Directive. And in any negotiations over a trade deal with the United States, the issue of access to British markets will come up. Alice, will you explain the issues involved in that? Why the Eurovision Audio Visual Directive matters? And if it goes, what are the possibilities? And whether you think the US government will be pushing for greater access to our markets. Well, first of all, the Audiovisual Media Services Directive will cease to apply as of you know, 2021, when we come out of the customs union and so on. And of course, we have already lost a very big uh, business, which was the TV channels business. You know, London was used as a hub to broadcast. Uh, all over Europe, you know, the localized versions, discovery, so on and so on. So we've already lost all that, that business, which was about a billion pounds of exports every year, so it was sort of handy for the balance of payments. But anyway, then of course, 
there's the regime of EU works quotas. And as you know, all the licenses of the broadcasters here require them to observe those EU works quotas. The Audiovisual Media Services Directive is, of course, the framework for that. But those quotas go back longer. They go back to the Convention on Transfrontier TV, 1989, Council of Europe. That document, that framework, we're hoping will preserve our access to the EU market because the EU never includes audiovisual media services or culture generally in any of its trade agreements. It has never done so and never will. So by coming out of the single market, we will lose our access, formally speaking, but we are a member of this convention. It doesn't have a secretariat. It isn't, doesn't have a legal framework. But So we can just hope for the best, let's say. But then, of course, um, the issue for us is that the US is insisting that audiovisual be part of the scope of the trade agreement. And all of this is in the public domain, because that's the way US trade policy works. All the industries sign up for their wish list. It becomes an enormous wish list. And of course, the UK, in its fragrant innocence coming out of the EU, has no appreciation of the process, the mechanisms, and how the, how the MPAA, the Motion Picture Association of America, has been after this agenda of taking down what they claim is European cultural protectionism. And the MPAA has even told the UK in this very nice letter, you know, public domain again, wants to make the UK a poster child for the kind of audiovisual provisions it would like to see in all future trade agreements of the US. Also, you can see sort of listen to that in that way, but you can also hear there's a menace underneath, which is the MPAA has, to, has told whoever wants to listen, that they will lobby against the US-UK trade agreement unless we fold. And I must say, the UK is so unusual that since the Brexit vote, we've had a lot of MPs pulsing about Washington saying, we will do anything, but anything, just anything. So we'll take the chicken, we'll take the beef, We'll take the pesticide residue containing cereals, baby food, children's food. We'll just take it all because that's the price. But how will this might this directly impact on the BBC and create problems for a future DG? OK, so obviously, the BBC has been ring-fenced because the MPAA will not go after the BBC. However, the fact is the creative economy is going to be very dramatically transformed once there are no more EU works quotas to be observed. People in the commercial area will tell you that this has created a two-tier system of pricing whereby UK content costs a thousand, just, just making it up, but basically UK content costs X for the broadcast window, and US content, which is in secondary distribution, costs X divided by five. So that's what's going to happen. We're going to have a market economy in the audiovisual sector, no more license obligations of all that. But you know, the fact is, anyway, by 2025 or whenever this agreement is ratified, 2023, you know, there will be so much transformation already. But all of that is going to impact the relative position of the BBC. No, just the BBC you will become alone in safeguarding Britishness. Can I just hold you at that point? I'm sorry to interrupt because David, I can see disagreeing. I, I what, with what do you disagree? Well, I, I, I admire Addis's passion. I think the MPAA will have zero impact on anything. There are already, uh, at the last count, 24 channels solely broadcasting US material in the UK. Um, uh, the uh, Ofcom license requirements of the public service uh, broadcasters are separate from, although they reflect uh, the European quotas, but the quotas have always been, in a sense, voluntary in the UK uh, for anyone other than the public service broadcast five. So E4 is 90% imports. Uh, even Channel 4 is already 25% imports every morning. It's just back-to-back -back 
uh, U.S. series. And, and you think that's a good thing? I am. I'm, I'm talking here. I'm talking here about protecting uh, the production of British content. And there won't be any problem right. because oh. it, the the only issue the MPA worry about is the uh, imposition of EU quotas on streamers. Well, that's never going to happen in the EU. Right, well, I'm going to stop. Anyway, I'm going to I don't think it's a big issue okay. at all, but it's certainly not a big it's issue. A, it's a now, hold on, I have to stop it. Now we're in Thank total you. agreement at this point. <laughs> I would uh, like to say that it may or may not be a major issue for the incoming DG, but he certainly needs to think very hard about it. Let's park that for a moment. Let's look at another immediate issue that he may inherit, uh, which is. Uh, well, he is inheriting, Patrick, a situation in which I think you told me earlier. Uh, well, you tell me what the VAV estimates the cut in so this BBC. So, Voice of the Listener and Viewer, and they're going to publish this in a couple of weeks. Uh, if you look at the net public funding of uh, the BBC's UK services, in other words, license fee plus some grants minus the top slicing to pay for other things then in real terms, that is inflation-adjusted terms, it is 25% less than in 2010. And that... What's that, a billion, you were telling me? It's 25% down. Yeah, in yeah. real terms. Um, it, yeah. it, yes, you could see, and the other way to look at it is to say that if it had the same real level of funding as in 2010, it would have a billion more. And therefore, when we look at the market trends which you're going to bring us to, which is to do with technology and younger viewers and all of that, uh, and increased content costs, increased distribution costs, uh, if it had the billion that it's lost, it would be able to invest in content and services for younger viewers and new technology without having to cut services, uh, traditional services. So it's had that net loss of 25% in 10 years. It's implementing cuts re now relating to the past license fee agreement. I was talking to the director of the news this morning about the cuts they are imposing and another 80 million in, in total. That's going to have to impact. And then we come to this problem of the over 75s. And David, it, it seems to me that the BBC has vastly underestimated the consequence of BBC representatives switching off significant numbers of over 75s, or rather penalizing them if they don't pay up. How, how on earth can the BBC handle this? Well, I'm confident that they know exactly what they're doing. <laughs> uh, they, <laughs> they always do. They've thought this through very, very clearly. Um, I'm anxious, uh, but confident. Essentially, um, the BBC blew this five years ago. Uh, as and when they signed on for the over-75s, uh, the responsibility for the over-75s, they should have said back in 2015, it all finishes June 2020. There will be no more free TV licenses. We go back to 2001, uh, when they were first introduced. And everyone would have known, and there'd have been years and years of preparation. And my late mother-in-law would not have been uh, threatening to go to jail rather than pay a TV license, which she thought was an outrageous imposition uh, on her life. That she could afford it was neither here nor there. It was just the principle of it. Uh, the, the, the serious problem is this, uh, and it's twofold. The BBC has got itself into the welfare business. It is operating a means test. It's it become. Well, David, you should the government put it into that situation? It's a bit it, unfair. No, to say they the BBC. could have easily said. They, and what they should have said in 2015 is, it's all over. Come. 2020, there will be no more free TV licenses, get ready for it. Instead, they fudged it and fudged it and fudged it, left it for three and a half years, then did a lengthy consultation and then came up with a series of really bad choices and chose one of the really bad choices, which so, was the means test. So to and that to the leaves chain. three million homes who won't be, in, who will still be importuned for their license. The, the letters have already started going out. They were going out 
last, last yeah. week. But, but it's going to have an unpredictable impact in terms of loss of revenue, slowdown of revenue, because the BBC depends on cash flow from the licence fee or being paid in advance, and the horrible PR that potentially could arise if tens of thousands of elderly people are suddenly <coughs> invited to turn up uh, at magistrates' courts. So, uh, good, so slightly to cut to the chase of the new DG, let's assume he's coming in or she's coming in in a situation with dreadful publicity, a real concern about cash flow. Is it conceivable that a new DG could say, right, we will stop that, we ourselves within the organization will find the money to fund those over 75s who were proposing to take the that's, a, that's another 500 million pounds a year and as Paddy has already said uh, the BBC's spending has dropped by the equivalent of a billion pounds oh. in the last uh, 8 to 10 years that's, I think the, the interesting political situation is that it's a card in the hands of Dominic Cummings, Bojo, whoever you think is playing this particular game. Uh, do you want us to get you off the hook? Which we could do for a couple of years if you agree to X, Y, and Z. Yeah, we will pay, the government will pay if you will do the yeah, other. Exactly. Right. That's what for me is the worst of the situation because it's the BBC has got a very weak hand. But taking the 500 million hits is not exactly fun, is it? No, that's right. So to compound the situation, if I may come to you at this, uh, we've got this de decriminalization, sorry, decriminalizing um, consultation, which is supposed to last for eight weeks. It's strange in a sense because I think the numbers of people who are prosecuted in the courts are something like ten or nine of actually so, gone to sorry, five, gone to, so five people went to prison. Five people have gone to prison. This is the nature of the problem. For not saying the five. Yeah. So you can have an in principle objection to it. Mm. In terms of it clogging up the courts, it's more difficult to make the case. Eight point three percent of the magistrate court's time. Right. There's a great deal of misinformation about this. Okay. Mm. If the government were to say, and at the end of the consultation, we will decriminalize non-payment of the license fee. Have you any idea, Alice, the financial consequences of that for the BBC? Well, we have some estimates in the public domain that I think are date from the last time. You know, as you know, this thing comes and goes like a wave. So the, in 2015, I think both the political parties had decriminalized their manifestos. And I think that from that perspective, the political situation on decrim is daunting for the BBC. My view is that the, D, the incoming DG, um, so first of all, to get back to those estimates, there's an estimate of about the level of evasion, say, going from 6 to 12 percent to, let's say, 10 percent for the sake of argument, so let's say a hit of 200 million. I, I think the principle, I mean, I, I can understand, I'm an economist, so I love, you know, this kind of technocratic discussion, but I actually think that in this particular instance, it's not a technocratic discussion, but a human one. And I'm thinking of the over 75s and those households and the situation around decrim. And I think that this is where the incoming DG will have to be brave and perhaps instruct the TV licensing authority that the criminal aspect can be turned off in situations that demand and command it. I'd love to see a DG that has some instinct that the BBC should be responsive to its core viewers, many of whom are over 75. But if, you know, I don't know how you estimate the cost, because if people know, if, if they're well, saying, Roger, I'm very happy with this. Anyone no, no, who no, wants that's to know no, no. the figure can find it in the Perry review from five yeah. years ago. And it, there's a very simple uh, little graph that you can draw. Decriminalizing means three different things. You can, uh, you can decriminalize, but still have a penalty fine yes. for not paying. You don't go to prison for not paying that fine, you go to prison for something else. So if you treated it like a renewal of your DVLA license, twice as many people went to prison for not paying the fine for 
not renewing their DVLA license, uh, sorry, mm. for um, council, uh, council tax, tax council evasion, tax. has went to prison tax. for uh, not paying the fine for the BBC. The only thing you can do is you can make life more difficult for the BBC, increase their costs at the margin with still a penalty of a fine and potentially imprisonment at the end. Decriminalizing that offence doesn't decriminalise non-payment. But I'm, I was trying to get at was how on earth do you forecast the, the hit on the BBC finances here? BBC did. Yeah, but do you believe that figure of 200 million? If, if you take the, the, the two versions of decriminalisation, the one that leaves the penalty still in place for non-payment of the fine adds 296 million to their costs through a mixture of evasion, uh, increased evasion and increased costs. The thing that would be a killer would be if it were decriminalized and it became a civil uh, debt which required quantification. Because at the moment, non-payment of your license, TV license, is an absolute offense and it's a snapshot offense. In other words, if you spend one minute with a piece of equipment that can receive signals and you don't pay your license, you're guilty and there's no mitigation. Under a civil debt, the BBC would have to measure its loss. So it would have to have a time span of from when to when you were an evader. This is almost impossible to administer. They'd have to have tens of thousands of people monitoring behavior. When did it start? When did it finish? Did it finish? Did they go away? So that would effectively unplug the license fee completely. It would become a voluntary fee. Mm. I, I would be really surprised if this decriminalization review went that far, but it's just another piece of posturing by an incoming administration saying, we've got sticks to wield as well. But so it's part of a negotiation. But I also That's think it's a legacy uh, it's a legacy of what happened between Tony Hall and Whittingdale and Osborne in that room, okay? Apparently, he agreed to take the cost on. And, and, and that's what people keep saying. Yeah, well, you know? one of the people, only one left standing now, shortly, right. and that's Whittingdale, who's back in yeah. office to look after the BBC. D uh, Patrick, do you criticize anything, uh, sorry, do you disagree with anything we've heard about criminalization? Well, I, the, I think what, at the very least, is yes. giving an incoming DG another financial headache and probably a public relations one as well. Well, so there's no question, it is both. Oh. And it is, I think, deliberately both. All right, that the, um, uh, what we haven't actually got is a specific proposal, as far as I can see, of what decrim would mean this time. A very good question is to say that this was reviewed by Perry, commissioned by a Conservative Minister, less than five years ago. There are two reasons why you might say, OK, well, we, despite that, we're going to do the opposite of what he said. The first is if you think Perry got it wrong, which is not what they're saying. The second is if you say, ah, oh, the world has changed so much because of Netflix and all that, that what, you know, Perry got the exam question, he got the answer, right answer to the exam question then, but we're living in a quite different world now. So what you're then arguing is that these poor people can't afford the 43 pence a day for the license fee, but they can afford super fast broadband and a smart TV or a laptop and Netflix and maybe some other monthly subscriptions. So you know, I know Marie Antoinette didn't actually say, let them eat cake, but if you, if you dig in, insofar as there is any rational logic behind this, you know, since they're not saying Perry got it wrong, the question to ask is, okay, why does Netflix mean it, Perry may have got it right then, but well, you would be wrong on. now. I'm going to seal off that discussion because I've got so much to go through, and we'll come back to it if I may. And I'm just at this point, interesting about the in-tray that the new DG is yeah. going to get. And just before we go on to the talk about some of the factors that will influence him or she in the future, mm. let me just deal with this question of a new chairman. Uh, the DG is going to be, the new DG is going to be in, um, in the job for what, a year at the most, before he gets a new chairman, mm -hmm. appointed by this government, mm -hmm. which will undoubtedly appoint a chair broadly in sympathy with what the government finally decides it wants to do. So what do you do as a new DG? 
What's the point of talking to you the get ahead chair? of him. You get ahead of the game and you're bold and you're brave in the one year you have with David. And then he comes in and he disagrees entirely as the government does with what you're proposing in the DG well, and you're fired. Yeah. Well, but then, you see, this... At least you're being brave, right? <clears throat> I agree with Alice, but you, th this is all in the context of realpolitik, okay? So the Sunday Times... Um, quotes sources at number 10 story, which I think probably we're all, you've actually got it to show here, okay? So, sources at number 10, right. we don't know the extent to which he was flying a kite and the extent to which he actually meant it, but he immediately got a backlash from, from uh, backbench MPs saying, you know, this wasn't in the manifesto, and you know, vote Tory, lose Radio 2 is not a good look. So I think a really important thing for the DG to do sort of immediately before the new chair comes in is be bold, but also to, um, you know, make, make these guys realize they are actually playing with fire. Okay, our collective, those of us who, who care about this, our collective task is to get the great British public to realize what is going on and what the consequences might be. And then there could be a massive backlash. They are taking a big political risk. If they do what you're describing, which is to put in a henchman who then fires a DG after only a year, that is not politically riskless. Well, okay, David, can I come to you? If you were DG, it's something you should have been, but there we are. If you were, you've got a year before a new chairman is appointed who is likely to be into sympathy with the way, and we'll go on to what, what, what the government wants to do if we can try and work it out. <laughs> what, what can you do in this year? Well, you, you've got to set up a whole range of options and you've got to have game plans and you've got to have plan A, B and C and you've got to cost them, you've got to work out the practicality, you've got to test the political waters for each of them, you've got to begin to probe what is really going on inside the governing party. It is, I mean as Paddy says, it's quite a broad church, there are plenty of people uh, in the Tory party who admire and, and uh, sympathise and indeed empathise with the BBC. Mm. And then there are the headbangers. Mm. Um, so you've got to figure, I don't think declaring war mm. on Dominic Cummings makes any sense. Mm. I don't think that's the right way forward. You've got to make clear that you're in control of all the options, upsides and downsides, so that by the time a new person arrives, the last thing you want is a Duke Hussey or a Lord Hill, who is only there to fire you, uh, if you're Alistair Milne or, or going all the way back to Hugh Green. Uh, it's, it's ironical that one of the candidates for DG is actually the granddaughter of Lord Hill. Um, Who's that? Carolyn Fairbairn. Oh. Uh, who would actually be an excellent person, mm. but uh, David, you should have said that. At least, sorry, I'm sorry, Carolyn. I apologise. Yeah, don't, don't kill her chances. Uh, I, just, I, <laughs> there's just loads of excellent yeah, candidates exactly. out there. But seriously, uh, essentially, uh, you've got to take the temperature of what is going on. And as Roger says, there's lots of big challenges. There's financial organizational, editorial, technological, and political. Uh, so you've got to have a person who can get across all of those. But it's not a case of nailing your colors to the mast and saying, what are you going to do, what are you going to do? That doesn't work. I also think that one of the real challenges for the BBC is to navigate the post-Brexit world and the storytelling that's associated with it. Because I think that the attack on the BBC really results from the fact that in a land where there's impartial, you know, impartial news and current affairs, you know, that the BBC relied on a lot of expertise that many people in government do not appreciate. For example, the fact that, you know, there are all sorts of very complicated issues. There's fishing rights issues, there's huge conflicts uh, around, you know, uh, all sorts of things, but that, that will test, you know, us. And so, you know, I think the, the challenge for the BBC, I would say, would also be to look at what it is like to be in a post-Brexit world and to, uh, uh, and to, to look at this as, 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 you know, if, so the BBC, in my view, stayed totally away 
from Brexit because guess what? It was toxic. But even by staying away from it, because it wasn't in favor of Brexit, it was seen as part of the enemy, part of the establishment, part of the suits that are, you know, many people think of the BBC as a huge propaganda machine. They don't realize that eight out of 10 people that work there are actually, you know, sound engineers and technicians and, and all that, that stuff. So I think, I think there is also this storytelling challenge for the BBC, the impartiality of news and current affairs. You know, how do you address, you know, how do you portray the situation in a way that doesn't make the person in number 10 go bonkers? I mean, can well, I say that this is yeah. an opportunity as well? Yeah. Okay, so the, the um, Brexit as a project, okay, was a sort of blank sheet of paper. I don't think they thought they were going to win the referendum, and therefore it's extremely vague about what's going to happen. This year, next year, this is sort of gradually crashing into reality. Now, however you sort of, whatever your view of all that, one part of that reality is the shopping list from the uh, US businesses and what they want sort of out of the trade deal, which is, as you say, in the, in the public domain. I think actually broadcasting is quite a small piece of that, but, you know... It's multi-sectoral, it covers it's everything. It covers everything. And we have to take the rubbish okay. food but to begin the with. The other though. thing is buccaneering Britain and all of that, the soft power matters. Yes. The fact that this is a very successful, not a very successful sector, which is also part of the creative industries, which are very successful. So, Bojo needs to be persuaded. This is actually part of the post brexit well, How do you, how do you at this well. point? So I know I keep interrupting. Forgive me, but I just want to make sure we cover the territory. I want to look now at the political will mm -hmm. and what we can make of the different signals coming out mm -hmm. of this. You will all see, or most will know about the. Um, uh, the, the, the article in the Sunday Times. Um, if it wasn't from Dominic Cummings, it's remarkably like everything he's been saying since 2004, <laughs> yes. almost, you know, literally word for word. If you go back, he hasn't changed his views, give him credit for consistency. Um, but he says, we are having a consultation and we will whack it yes. in the BBC. Um, if you look at Julian Knight, MP, who's the newly elected chair of the backbench DCMS committee, uh, he got the job partly with, his MP, with the backing of the MPs because of an article he wrote in which he said he wants a proper root and branch review of the BBC to help it find a new model and a new role, still special but on a more level playing field. Specifically, he said the BBC needs to gradually phase out the license fee, make the BBC more responsive to the public, open up its budgets to external talent. And Paul Goodman, who is runs or is the chief commentator in Conservative Home, which is, well, it seems to me, a very good and accurate reflection of conservative thinking, uh, wrote an article saying uh, the choice facing the corporation isn't between change or no change, but between one kind of change and another, and ultimately less money plus the right reform. And then they go into all of those things. So, how do you judge, uh, David, the political... Do you think, and John Whittingdale, we know, is well informed because of his previous, ex previous experience, is on the right wing of the party, but understands the difficulties and the problems that are coming forward. So, do you think there is a big argument to be had within the government, or do you think it's now possible to see the broad outlines of the government's, this government's approach to the BBC and to its future? Well, I, I'm glad you mentioned Whittingdale because um, he was much maligned when he was appointed uh, Secretary of State and turned out not quite to be a pussycat, but certainly mm. not the enemy of this state uh, that mm. uh, many presented him as. And it, I think it's interesting that, A, he should accept a junior post at the department he used to run, uh, but be that it's uh, the Minister of State in this area. But uh, David, I read that well, as being, he's, got, he's been given BBC. But he's in charge of trade. He trade? Well, he's a Minister of State okay. who has a uh, huge experience in broadcasting. It would be remarkable if, if Boris put him in there not to have an influence on this uh, matter. And uh, John has got very good um, connections with various wings of the Tory party. And he knows that there are different strands here. There are those who 
want to break up the BBC because of its scale and scope and dominance, etc. There are those who worry that the BBC is far too dominant as an editorial voice with too big a share of news consumption. There are those who think that the BBC is not entrepreneurial enough, uh, hasn't made an, a big enough splash in the world with its um, uh, IP. There are those who think that uh, it would be better off to be divided into different groupings, so radio, television, production, distribution, UK TV, whatever it might be. These are all different strands. And then there are those who dislike the license fee for a number of different reasons. Um, and it, 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 in a way, it's barely worth spelling out all those reasons because it all unifies around couldn't we please change the license fee in some way or other. And obviously there's loads of ways you can replace it with a, an uplift on council tax. You can... Can we not uh, just you know, pursue such close to do that, David? So what you're saying, uh, I, I just want to get this sense that... You know, there, when isn't, there isn't a clear policy, mm -hmm. and I would just say, if the BBC can't be lucky in its friends, let it be lucky in its enemies. Mm -hmm. So if Dominic Cummings is shouting the roof off, saying we're going to whack the BBC, mm -hmm. that's good news for yes. the BBC. Yeah. But I've heard bad. that Paul Goodman again, and one to others, has said the likely outcome, less money, reform, and the reform is likely to be fewer BBC TV stations, a reduced number of radio services, a scaled back website, more, more production and more BBC out of London, and interestingly, more spent on the World Service. And that's the outline he put forward. Is that, it? Can I, let me put, sorry, well, Alice. You're, 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 you we actually have safeguards around the existing regime, okay, and let's not forget there are 22,000 people that work for the BBC, and they must not be appreciating the daily attack on their livelihoods. So I would say another challenge for the DG is to pick up the demoralized staff mm. issue, and because one of you know, it is a, a very large organization. Very few people ever will be running an organization with 22,000 people in operations here, there, and everywhere in the U.S. and so on. And that's why, you know, we, you know, I think that people are, are, are looking at a DG who, as you say, you know, might have some comprehension of tech and some comprehension of of you know the challenges of adjusting to a du you know in a dual trans distribution you know mode. So I think. You know, there are lots of new MPs. The BBC has lots of support among those people. I worry those MPs are going to become attackers when the over 75s line up in their constituency offices, you know, showing the letters, okay? And I think this is something that people don't understand is going to happen for sure. Okay, can I just then look at, um, we've talked about, we don't know what the government's going to do, we know the broad direction, it's a question of the speed, it's going to go there, but are there technological obstacles to what it might want to do? You hear people say, oh, a subscription, mm. that's the answer, but there are very significant technical problems at the moment, aren't there? Yeah, gate preview, everybody knows that, Whittingdale knows that. Yeah, but it's completely irrelevant. Uh, uh, nobody is saying that uh, public service content should go behind a paywall, least of all listed events, uh, which would be illegal to go behind a paywall. The only version of subscription that is being considered is an entertainment package from the BBC, uh, leaving all the public service content to be funded from public funds. Well, so, so, so you're saying a, a, a reduced, possibly a reduced license fee? Reduced or replaced. Yeah. But a subscription, but this couldn't apply to radio at all. No, no, it? radio would have to be funded out of public mm -hmm. funds. Yep. So it is now. So when, so when you know, you get an ideologue who says go to subscription and he's sitting down saying, how do we make this work? The answer is it can't work for radio at the moment. Well, well, Roger, so they simply haven't never thought through. Well, right, so you tell me, tell me. They simply right. haven't thought it through. Right, just tell me, you are now, you've got a, a right wing Tories that want to do subscription. What do you sit down and tell them? Well, sorry, you ask them, tell me what, you're, what you mean. 
This is very similar to Brexit. What is it you need? Okay. But can you please be specific? Let me. So when people talk about it, they actually forget about radio and all the other stuff. They, you know, they literally don't make the connection. So they think we're talking about BBC TV. There is the issue of uh, obviously you, you have to. You have to have conditional access technology on every reception device. It is debatable how big an issue that is. Uh, it's clearly a surmountable one. It might cost a bit more if you try to surmount it quickly, but it's, it's an execution thing. David's thought a lot about this and uh, is one of the people who thinks it's actually rather a small issue. But supposing you could just do that and every device capable of delivering BBC TV had conditional access. Supposing you had that, okay, you've still got an absolute car crash on your hands. Firstly, because you've got to pay for radio, etc., etc. But secondly, rather a simple question, which is, how would you price this? Okay, you, you could you can cut the BBC into pieces and say, well, this bit's this, this, this we're going to call this bit public service. We're going to forget what Ruth said, which is, you know, inform, educate, and entertain. And the fact that it's actually a creative industry and the same program does more, more than one of those things. So, you, you know, you don't get this sort of issue of, you know, should it do strictly and all of that. So you've got those options, but let's keep it really simple. Let's say you've just got a single bundle and a single price. Okay, which they've never actually come out and proposed because we're talking about people like the IEA, which is essentially a sort of religious organization which doesn't have to sort of you know, <laughs> say what are you actually proposing. Okay? Uh, broadly, supposing you say we're going to pitch the price at the same level as the license fee. Okay? The truth is nobody knows how the market would respond. What we do know is your overheads would go up a lot just look at Sky's annual report. Sky is not a badly run organization. It has very high It overhead. was exceptionally run on one, you know, a little oh, well, early even on it, It's not quite as well run as David's. But, the, the, <laughs> but you, you can't have pay TV without not only conditional access, but also marketing and customer service and lots of kids. You know. but, but, but bear in mind, uh, Sky is a technology company, not a really a content company. I mean, it does uh, telephony, broadband, um, all kinds of um, uh, platform management. Making programs is a very small part of its business. When I was director of programs at Sky, I was probably number 33 in the pecking order. But, but I was David, lucky to David, get into Sam's that's, office. That is quite, and I had a budget of David, 35 it, million pounds. David, that is completely irrelevant to the point I'm making. <laughs> David, can I ask you honestly, to listen? Honestly, Paddy, David, can I, if I was running the BBC as a chair, could you please... No, I think at this I point, the cost. I think at this point I have to bring Alice here to adjudicate. I mean, in, the, in terms of the, the technological... Oh, sorry, I, 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 sorry, I really haven't finished, OK? So this, uh, now, this, Patrick, I'll come back to you, I promise you. Okay. But I nearly must move on. I'm sorry, I apologise. It's, it's a car crash. All oh, right, right, we've got that. <laughs> Alice, is there, is there anything you want to add about the if you like, technological issues that you think those who wish to talk about subscription and other well, elements have not considered? So we all know that the eyes will turn immediately to the eye player because, of course, that's a gateable uh, service. And, of course, it might, you know, you'd have to fiddle it, you know, a bit with it. But, of course, the fact is that would be another car crash for a different reason, and that's because we all know that to the extent that the BBC is viewed by young people, and may I say I have one observation in my household. I have a son who's, uh, who's a oops, he's uh, 16. Anyway, he will, you know, he'll only watch BBC on iPlayer. Right, and he, for him, it's just a surface thing. Oh, it's I play this or that. He has no idea of you know all oh, this, that, or the other. You know, Sky one minute, Netflix the next, Amazon, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Imagine he goes and he, he comes up against you know a gate, you know, and of course, yes, you know, we are we have Netflix and so on. Yes, we could we could subscribe to the BBC, but the point is, for the average young person that the BBC most wants to hang on to, that's a clear turn off. My other point is, so, so Freeview has a legacy for us, and let's just say that people act like Freeview was a thousand years ago. It was not a thousand years ago. Okay, it was ten years ago, and it was a very major effort to get a lot of elderly people to switch over to Freeview to understand what the opportunities were, and many people still don't. 
But I don't think that we should look at this as a sort of, you know, picnic issue. Conditional access technology is no picnic issue. It's, 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 it wouldn't, and fortunately, maybe his voice will be heard on this. Right. I want to go to the third, and I promise I'll come to you for questions after this next section. Mm -hmm. Forgive me, I'm just trying to complete what we're about. The final thing I want to talk and to explore with you, however, is what the audience is doing. Because the DG must look at the figures for what young people are not listening or watching and think, what on earth can I do about this? Because if it continues, it is an exceedingly difficult issue. I mean, could you just, Dallas, give us an indication of how much of a problem the BBC has with its absent younger audience? Well, it has a problem that is relatively larger than Channel 4. Okay, thank, thank the Lord, otherwise <laughs> Channel 4 should be worried. But also, relative to, the, to ITV, I mean, I. I wish I had spent, you know, uh, another 20 years studying this, but the fact is, is that young people have a lot of opportunities uh, to do things with their lives that don't involve being couch potatoes. You know, in the UK, it's always been viewed that there's a life stage transformation, you know? You, you know, you kick up your heels for a little bit, you go a lot out to the cinema because it gets you away from your invasive parents and, and allows you to commune with your friends. And then you eventually get married, you have a, a stag night, a hen night, and so on and so on. You know, all these things that you have to have. You settle down, you have children, the children become exposed to CBBs, you love it, you become a supporter of the BBC, you start to actually enjoy family entertainment because you've got children, which we would like to encourage people to have. These life stage transformations are really important in terms of the support for the license fee and an understanding of what it's actually giving. Okay? People say CCBB has only cost 30 million to make. So why was David Clementi threatening to close it down last week? I don't know. I think he's chairman of the BBC. Anyway, it's an interesting choice. David, do you want to add on this point about, about the, 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 the way, uh, did, what the DG will face in terms of the desert, desertion or absence of, increasing absence of certain audiences? Well, the, you just have to read the Ofcom uh, report mm -hmm. on the BBC from October mm -hmm. of last year, and that was the thing uh, uppermost in Ofcom's mind. The, mm -hmm. uh, the inability of the BBC apparently to get to grips with the loss of the younger audience, both for iPlayer, where uh, the iPlayer is now disappearing off young people's agenda. 65% uh, of them use Netflix every week, 26% of them the iPlayer. That's going down rapidly. I think 30% drop in usage in one year. Uh, in radio, although BBC Sound has been launched, there's still a huge loss of radio listening, even as commercial radio listening is going up. Uh, and uh, you've got um, a, a real problem with the average age of the BBC audience t for TV, which is 61, which um, by some standards is stupidly young, uh, but by others is worryingly old. Um, especially if half of them are about to be sent letters saying exactly. pay up or, or go to jail. Uh, so uh, it, it is, but I don't think it's an existential problem. I think it's a progressive issue and it's all part of how does the BBC adjust to the realities of the audience it is attempting to address, even as it deals with global challenges and the realization that all the top drama productions uh, are, are now being funded by US competitors or Sky. But uh, I ask so you, yeah. They've got creative issues in amongst the organizational audience and financial issues. La one last question for at this point, and then I'm going to the audience. Patrick, Pat Alice would follow up on this. In terms of Netflix and so on, I want to explain something which I don't understand, which is Netflix, A, is not making a profit. Mm. It's investing staggering sums. Mm. It's not making a profit. Mm. Presumably that's all right in business if you think you're going to get to a position of such dominance that you could then start upping the cost of the revenue. That's the claim, yes. Yeah. At the same time, Disney and other organizations mm. 
I've said, oh, that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. In fact, the, maybe the Premier League is thinking, hello, mm -hmm. do we need anybody between us and the mm -hmm. public? Mm -hmm. So we think of Netflix, or some of us talk about Netflix, as it's a new, almost permanent reality. Mm -hmm. Is it? Not necessarily. I mean, the truth is nobody knows. The markets, the financial markets have been backing it, um, but, you know, the, the elastic may break. I mean, the truth is nobody knows that whether, whether it's, it's going to be a car uh, crash. Uh, do, 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 do you agree with that? And, sorry, SVOD is, is, is here to stay. So online broadcasting is here to stay. And this is where I come back to the 25% real cuts. Part of the DG's job is to get the public to realize that what you've got is increasing real costs of content and distribution, because you have to have the old and the new, you have to pay for both types of network, at the same time as its costs, its funding has already been cut by 25% before decrim, before we have a, a rebellion about, about the over 75s. Okay? And so what you want is for the public to understand what is going on. If the public understands what is going on, then I think the political costs to, to continuing to attack the BBC become very high. Alice, do you do, what's your view about the future of Netflix and other things which we well, regard as semi-permanent now? I, I would go with you, semi-permanent, indeed permanent. I mean, I think, of course, we all look at the power, what we're seeing in Netflix is the power of US capital, let's face it, okay? An endless, you know, we are tiny, puny next to the United States, and believe me, we're going to be informed about that every day. <laughs> uh, and the Huawei is just the tip of the iceberg. But, so I think that we, you know, in the face of this, so, and I think that what is, this comes back to the question I initially asked, which is, do we care about British content? Do we care about British voices, British stories? Do we care about that? I thought people cared about that in this place, and I'm very surprised that we are sitting here talking as if the BBC was expendable. To me, the Netflix model is totally distinct. Netflix has no mission. It's there. It answers to its commercial shareholders. That's what it's about. Look at the British content it makes. You know, and, and look at the quality and the, the, the scope and, and so on of what we have now. And I, I fear for the loss of well, that. It's 15 drama series in Britain at the moment, which, and it's probably going to double that next year. It's so a fraction of what, of what people, what the BBC ITV channel really? expect. It's a fraction. Uh, it's sadly, it. not true. ITV broadcasts 100 hours of drama a year of originated drama. Uh, the BBC, 150. Uh, you know, and bear in mind, Roger, there are 72 streaming services in the US. Netflix is just one of many. Okay. Uh, thanks. At this point, if you'd like to withdraw your applications for the Director General <laughs> uh, of the BBC, you may do so. Uh, what I want to do for the remainder of the time we've got is uh, have you ask whatever questions you would like for the next 15, 20 minutes, at the end of which I'm going to put these three people on the spot and say they are the future. They've just been appointed the new DG. What's the first three things they say? <laughs> I know it's wrong. Right, OK. What I'd like to do is put your hand up, please, if you ask us a question, and if we say who you are. And I'll take one the front one, then one at the back. Lady there, yeah. And could you, could you identify yourself? And also say to whom you would like the question for. Hi, Mike. Is it working? Hello? Yep. Keep speaking. We'll see. Microphone, is it switch? You've got a switch on the mic? Tech. <laughs> yeah. Stand up and shout. It's a good room. Yeah. Have a go. Right, okay. My name is Malika, um, and I'm new to the BBC. I've joined eight months ago. My question mainly is around the fact that there are there's, there's loads of, there are loads of conversations going on about a subscription-based model, as we've just discussed. And considering the pitfalls involved, um, do you think an ad-funded model is on the cards in the future while we get to keep the lic license fee as compulsory for news and current affairs, but at a much lower cost to the public? 
Southie, which suggesting if you keep news and current affairs without any advertising at all, but elsewhere introduce advertising. Do you think of, uh, would you introduce it everywhere other than news and current affairs? Is that what you Yes, and so my point is everywhere other than news and current affairs, including sport, you have an advertising funded model, whereas news and current affairs sticks to a mandatory license fee, however, at a much, much reduced rate for the public. So Alice, first of all, would it raise, uh, would that raise a significant sum of money, even if you don't want it to happen, would it raise a significant money and would it bankrupt the rest of British television? Well, I think that's the point, really. The, the, okay, we know TV revenues have been soft for the last couple of years, you know, the Brexit situation and all that, and of course the future is troubled for TV advertising revenues. Our view is that there's only a certain pot, right? So the pot's only going to be chopped and changed in a different way. We think that the current situation is the ideal one because impoverishing the ITV or Channel 4 for the benefit of the BBC will bring their scale of activity down and will hurt all three of them, to be honest. There is no you know, bill that they will come, you know, people talk about sponsorships, maybe we could have I don't know, car manufacturers sponsoring strictly. And I say, excuse me, are we talking here something really serious? And I would say, please, let's not go back down that track of talking about advertising. There just isn't a, a gusher there. Can I say that, uh, do you disagree? If not, we'll go on to the next question. Just in one respect, absolutely right on TV. Uh, advertising would have to be absolutely at the margin. In radio, it's slightly odd. I used to be chairman of the Commercial Radio Companies Association, and when it was mooted that Radios 1 and 2, this is 10 years ago, it might be spun off and ad-funded, there was a mixed response mm. from the owners. Yeah. Quite a few of them thought, well, this will enlarge the radio advertising market, make it more interesting, give more uh, different propositions, and suddenly people will move some of their budgets from three other media to radio. Unproven, but it's a possibility. In TV, I think it would be a failure. Right. Okay, gentlemen there. Thank you very much for the question. Thank you. Hello. Having read an article in The Spectator this week uh, mm. suggesting that the BBC emulate the Japanese broadcaster NHK, could any of you speak to any uh, comparative um, international public service broadcasting models that strike you as interesting in view of this debate or of any um, historical examples of um, such funding being withdrawn or reduced? Patrick. Uh, well, that's rather a big question. Uh, NHK, uh, of course, gets more public funding than the BBC. So one of the numerous bits of misinformation about the BBC is that it's the best, public, best funded public service broadcaster um, in the world. Uh, I think the most interesting uh, example is actually what the, the Cyprus TV, or Cyprus Broadcasting, that CYBC, which was set up by the Brits in the 1950s, was funded rather cleverly by a levy on your electricity bill, which is extremely clever because uh, it actually gives you conditional access because, you know, <laughs> if you don't pay your electricity bill, the electricity is cut off. But it's also progressive because large, rich families, uh, you know, use more electricity. And by the way, you can't watch TV uh, without electricity. So it, it's actually a rather good method. For reasons I have not discovered, in 2000, the politics of Cyprus were such that they stopped doing that, and it's now paid for out of general taxation. So I think that uh, there are actually quite a few lessons to be learned. Clearly, the really interesting one is Germany and, and, now, um, uh, and, and now Ireland, uh, which is, um, I think that to me, the license fee linked to ownership of a TV set is an anachronism. And uh, what we really need is a proper review which looks at all the options. My forecast is that advertising will get thrown out very quickly. Um, Peacock threw it out for two reasons. There are two additional reasons they didn't even think about as well. So I think advertising is an absolute no-no and won't be discussed. Subscriptions will be looked at closely and then thrown out. And I think then you will end up with a household levy like in Germany. Yeah, without going to that, uh, uh, David, now, could you say, are there any other broadcasting models or broadcasters out there that we should really look at and examine their systems? In terms of finance or yes. in terms of... Essentially, I think, in terms of finance. Well, in terms of finance, um, the, the license fee is kind of slowly receding across Europe and is being replaced by a number of different things. 
um, a, a levy, a, a, an uplift on the equivalent of council tax is uh, quite popular uh, in European countries. Uh, bear in mind there are European countries with license fees twice the UK uh, license fee. Switzerland has 300. But, but no Daily Mail. And, uh, <laughs> there's plenty of unpleasant people in Switzerland, I can tell you. You don't, you don't need Paul Dacre to attack. But uh, it, 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 I don't think these are um, binary choices. Uh, the key issue is how do you fund public service content? How much of that do you want the BBC to deliver? And how should that bit be funded? Should it all be funded out of the same pot, i.e. the BBC public service content and anybody else's? And how should you organize it? And should it be run on a contestable basis rather than institutional David, basis? you're talking like an economist, and I yeah. don't mean that in a nice way. Oh, I'm sorry, dear. <laughs> but the, but the, the uh, public service broadcast that I look to is actually in Sweden. Uh, because I think SVT is better organized mm. than the BBC, not least because mm. SVT radio is completely separate from SVT television. So you have two editorial inputs there who are mm. independent of each other. But broadly speaking, uh, there's not a lot to learn from NHK other than that when they went down one of the decriminalization options, Evasion rose from 4% to 25%, which was rather alarming. Alice, could you agree that all prospective candidates for the DG should, should now be booking their flights to Sweden? Well, may I just point out that we're actually talking about a very large geography where there's no question that public service broadcasting has an, an important place in society. All we need to look is at the U.S. to see the opposite. All right, because of course nobody's mentioned looking at their regime, but actually I would say that is actually one of the issues that we have here. I mean, what is the supply and demand of public service broadcasting that this country is prepared to fund and finance on a very long-term basis and one that is independent of interference from the politicians of the day who will always seek to make the BBC either an arch enemy or an arch ally? Right, no, sorry, we have to move on. Next question, yeah. Hi, uh, Christian Aurora. I work for, um, used to work for the BBC. I work for an Australian public broadcaster now uh, called SBS. Um, and my question is actually going, got it getting onto the politics rather than the economics, because I think in the DG's intro should be um, how, uh, how the BBC confronts a far-right government who is, for ideological reasons, attempting to control the independent and impartial information that resides in the BBC. The BBC DG is, as I understand it, the editor-in-chief of the BBC as well. And I think sometimes that role is not taken, it gets lost in all of this debate around funding. And I think what happened um, in the referendum and uh, the three years of, of the referendum is that the BBC lost the trust of the public because of weak management in news, which didn't do all the things that people that we now know um, have, have come to pass in terms of, of uh, confronting lies from one side. Um, and I think the, the BBC DG does need to <coughs> take on board the fact that a large percentage of the population now doesn't trust the BBC. Well, can I just ask you, Pat Patrick, throw this one to you, which is, is this the inevitable result of a divided society? They used to say the BBC, if the, if the country is divided, the BBC is on, a rack, on the rack. Mm. Normally, there's a consensus somewhere in the middle that would be broadly supportive of the BBC. Is the lesson of Brexit, there was no consensus, no one would be satisfied. The BBC made mistakes, but it was always going to make enemies. Well, it's happened twice. It happened in 1926 with the general strike. Um, and then Brexit is the other sort of really toxic thing. The extraordinary thing is, you're wrong. The extraordinary thing is, you're wrong. These constant efforts to persuade the public not to trust the BBC have failed. The, the rather good analogy is the football referee, in which people on the right think the referee is, is you know, biased against them, and people on the left think the referee is biased against them. And there are roughly equal numbers of them. 
Uh, and that is despite years of trying to persuade the public not to trust the BBC. So one of the things you'll see in the annual report, and it, this is a thing which, if you like, exaggerates this, but if you're asked the question, which one media source would you go to for accurate news, and the BBC has, to my knowledge, only once had a serious problem with accuracy, and that was um, coming after um, Savile was, was then the senior Tory who was, who was accused of being a paedophile, and they got the story wrong. But in nearly 100 years, there's been virtually no evidence-based attack on the BBC on accuracy. The attacks are on impartiality, and the extraordinary thing is how they failed. That the BBC is by far the most trusted media source in the UK, and the newspapers which are constantly attacking it are way down at the bottom. But David, do you think it's less trusted? It may be the most trusted, but is it less trusted than it was? It's not, not, not in any meaningful, not, uh, what the data say. not in statistical terms. Yeah. I mean, it's mo margins. You're in the mid 70s or the low 70s. Yeah. It, there's, there's, uh, as Paddy said, it dipped into the 60s immediately after Savile. Mm. But it, it, again, if you read the Ofcom report on the BBC, it, it found distinct public unease with the BBC's editorial output, largely as a result of the, the referendum and post-referendum mm -hmm. coverage. And personally, uh, you know, I think the BBC is pretty good, but occasionally it just makes ghastly errors. I think it was, mm -hmm. you know, the, the Cliff Richard affair was mm -hmm. a terrible mistake, and mm -hmm. uh, that nobody got fired for that is a mm -hmm. horrible condemnation of the BBC. Uh, exe uh, board um, and you know letting Andrew Neil harangue uh, Boris Johnson on your screens screen yeah. was illegal yeah. as yeah. well as unwise. Yeah. David, on the Savile thing, I just, just the thing on the Savile thing, the BBC put not only did they support the decision, they put the coverage up for an RTS award, yes. Yes. and yes. thank God the RTS. But I was on the panel, stopped it. Um, at the end, so in other words, it wasn't just an immediate, uh, well, we can't drop this person in it. It was a continuous unawareness well, let, of the scale. Let me, let me give you another personal insight then. That after the Cliff Richard affair, uh, when the judge issued the most excoriating judgment against the BBC, uh, executive after executive rubbished uh, in the course of the judgment. Tony Hall took it upon himself to say the judge had got the law wrong. Mm. Uh, he had personally turned down an offer from Cliff Richard to drop the proceedings in exchange for an apology. Mm. That cost the BBC two million pounds. Mm. And then BBC Radio, the Today programme, twice telephoned me to see if I would participate in a discussion about the Cliff Richard uh, judgment. Um, and each time asked me, do I support the BBC's position on uh, the Cliff Richard affair, and I said no, and each time I was disinvited. <laughs> so, uh, you know, when it gets it wrong, it really yeah. gets it wrong. But, but it's still trusted. Mm. Two more questions, I'm afraid, before we have to close down and we have to uh, ask these uh, potential DG candidates for their opening speeches. Uh, Peter, and then come to this lady. Peter York. Okay. I'm Peter York. Prof Barwise and I have just finished a book which answers all these questions yes. um, in a very definitive way, available from Lord Penguin, but not just yet. Can I just say at this but point, another book is being written, edited by John Mayer, in yes. which Fiona Chester is not quite writing. the same as John's We book. shall see. We shall. So carry on, Peter. Which is what we might call an anthology. Hmm. Yeah. Um, he's very clever. Yes. Okay. Now, After the advertising, what's the yes. point? The point is this. I think it was David who said one of the important things about the next DG is that he should choose his enemies wisely. Or she. Or she. she I'm so sorry. He or she or should they. choose they. <laughs> uh, should choose their enemies wisely. Now, I don't know how many of you here know about the Wayback Machine discovery of what Dominic Cummins said about the BBC in 2004. Put your hands up. How many of you know that thing? It's basically what he's saying in it's, 2020. It's clearly a sort of, it's, it's not quite. 
it's a sort of, it sounds like it's a bit of a policy wonk thing. So get yourself up that learning curve, mm. because in defining the enmity, that is the definitive document. You can get it from a combination of the Guardian and the Indy. In 2004, I'll be quick, he, uh, Dominic Cummins said, um, the, um, the BBC is the mortal enemy of the Conservative Party, not humanity, not working class people behind the red line, of the Conservative Party, and therefore it should be destroyed in any other words. He went on to define how you should do it. First, you should discredit it online. In 2004, that was a rather advanced thing to say, but he described how you should do it. That's because he knew a lot of American lobbyists who'd been doing that sort of thing. It was modern in England. Second, he said, you, you should have Fox News in Britain. How very modern that was. Third, he said, that you should have a lot of phone-in right-wing radio stations with Rush Limbaugh-type shock jobs. And fourth, you should have paid political advertising. You should have left the man on paid political advertising. Now, was that, were those th things clever to if they were repeated in the context of the new discussion, if the DG, the new DG, he, she, it, were to bring it up forward, are those clever things to say in a British context? Is that choosing your enemy well? I think he self-selected himself as an enemy uh, yes. long ago, and I'm sure the incoming DG, hisness or hersness, will be a massive factor. But I take, I take a bet. I, don't, I think there's no chance of Dominic Cummings being in his prison job in two years' time. Mm. He's a very convenient figure for mm. Johnson to test the waters, to mm. extert the pressure. Mm. I, would be, I don't know what your assessment is. Mm. I would be surprised if he lasts the course and in the end, if Johnson follows him all the way, but in the short term, he's a very significant figure. But and I think that, you know, the point you're raising, which is really a fundamental one, is, is, is the one that's right next to the question I raised, what is the supply and demand of public service broadcasting? Because if the, de if, if the demand for it is zero, then all we have is the market economy. Do we give up the impartiality of current news, of, of, of current affairs and news? You know, we just had a very major fine, seventy-five thousand pounds assessed on uh, on on a talk show radio around that. You know, that's the kind for George of, Galloway, yeah. yeah, yeah. And that's the kind of environment that, that that people think. You know, in the United States, as you know, well, U.S. food standards are ideal. U.S. media policy is ideal. Everything is ideal. Their copyrights ideal. Everything's ideal. So, should we just surrender to the market economy? And then I say to you. Let's look at that scenario, and what will the supply of British content be left? Okay, now you'll say, maybe that's not the most important question, but it actually happens to be the most important question to me. Okay, final question. Sorry, yeah, thank you, Peter. By the way, when's the book going to be published? <laughs> August the 6th. Mark your diaries, August the 6th. Maybe too late. Right. Okay. You can, you, you can, you can pre-order um, Peter and Paddy's book on Amazon, which I've already done. You can pre-order it on Amazon. Pre you can pre-order it. You can pre-order it. Yes, 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 yes. Sorry, just, just no, don't get carried away. Yes. Don't get yeah. carried away. Right, sorry, yes. your point. So, um, my name is Mimi Turner, and I uh, work in marketing strategy. I've worked with a number of different media businesses over the years. And my question is this. How does the incoming Director General of the BBC manage and improve on the BBC's brand? And I use that word because I mean that, and I don't mean usage. Um, the brand of the BBC is what I think has been lost, and thus the confidence of the end user, who is the customer. The reason that Aston Martin is a great brand is not because the people who drive Aston Martins think that Aston Martins are great. The reason that Aston Martin is a great brand is because everybody from a six-year-old boy to a 106-year-old man or woman think that Aston Martin is a great brand. Without the confidence of the public, the BBC 
cannot claim to be a, big, a great brand, even though it may be the producer of great programming. So the issue of brand, which is what people think of the BBC, is actually paramount. You know, if the BBC has a brand problem, it doesn't matter that it has a Boris problem or a Dominic Cummings problem. The brand problem is the existential well, can problem. Well, I just ask you, put it back to you a bit, yes. you imply from that that it had an exceptional brand and it now has damaged its brand. How, in your view, has it damaged its brand? I feel that, the, um, so I, d I think that one person cannot answer the question of brand. Brand is essentially a question that you are asking of But your all question customers. presupposes yes. that the BBC's brand is not good enough. Uh, because I think the discussion, even 10 years ago, and I was a media journalist, uh, uh, about the BBC, the BBC was a prominent voice in positive things. I think if the BBC will run their own internal customer satisfaction and brand awareness, you know, you ask a 16-year-old, I was thinking, what would my 16-year-old think about the conversation about criminalization and the license fee and the value? You know, those are not, those, as a brand that is less relevant, then it ought to be, partly because I think it has not itself launched a discourse about its value to society. Does that imply that you think the BBC does not itself know what it is? I think the BBC has absolutely, well, no, I don't, I don't speak for the BBC. I, I think that t in order to be able to express your brand, you have to understand what job you do for a customer that helps a customer progress through the things that matter to them. And I think if you cannot articulate that, uh, I don't know what I hire Radio 4 to do for me. Is it to tell me what's happening in the world? Is it to give me another lecture on gender equality? You know, I don't really understand that. It, the, these, these, these concepts are, require clarity, and they require clarity so that everybody can understand them. And I feel that that's what isn't, isn't, isn't clear to me from the BBC. And finally, I'm going to move from that straight to the closing remarks because that's an issue that they have to address. So, Patrick, let's start with you. You are appointed, you meet the press, and you talk to the BBC staff on the ring main and also to the public. And how would you pitch it? And what would be the key things you would say now that you are going to be DG for a sum of money, maybe slightly more than... Tony Hall uh, gets at the moment, but vastly less than you could the, get. The first thing everywhere I would else. say is, how the hell did this happen? But let's <laughs> uh, pass, pass over that. I, I think it's uh, not likely. Number one is one of the things that Alice mentioned, which is he has to, or she, or they have to steady the ship internally. Um, and uh, so there's a pure internal leadership task which is sort of urgent and you know there's quite a long agenda, the gender payback, all of, all of that. Number two, which I think is absolutely crucial, several of the questions um, have sort of implied this, the thing which the politicians will respond to is losing their seats. All right, and therefore it's about public opinion. Now, actually, I think the BBC brand is in much better nick than you're suggesting. Um, and I'm someone who thinks that with the great majority of brands, the main driver of brand value is customer experience of the product or service, you know, sort of like Toyota. And then there are some minor exceptions, but they are actually fairly minor. And I think the BBC, uh, you know, this is something which. Uh, is consumed by almost everyone for an average per capita of 18 hours per week. <laughs> right? This is, it is, the consumption of this brand is on a, a, a completely different scale from, say, Coca-Cola. I mean, it's two orders of magnitude bigger than Coca-Cola. So the British public, one reason why these efforts to persuade the public not to trust the BBC have been so unsuccessful is the BBC, the public has enormous experience of the products that this organization is providing. It is an infuriating organization, I gather, to work for and to deal with. Yes. And I have to say, to try and help as well. <laughs> you know, and I can show you the bruises. David has even more bruises, I believe, than, than I have from that. So communicating the issues in an evidence-based way to the British public. And if you look at what the backbenchers said after Cummings was let out of his hutch briefly uh, last Sunday, if you look at what the backbenchers then said, then they said, this is going to lose us votes. Okay, so the, the key task is to communicate the genuine choices. Now, I think the BBC has failed to do that.
I think that uh, the research they should have done about um, the over 75s would have been, okay, supposing we do what um, Johnson and others have said, we should cough up ourselves, okay? That's 745 million a year. Here are some shopping lists of services we could cut. You then run some proper one-day workshops with around 100 people, citizens' workshops, and you get them to make the tough choices, to say, here are, here are the cuts you could make. Okay? And then you communicate to the public, that's what we're talking about. And then if we only have cuts of 245 million, because we're limiting it to households in which there's at least one person. By the way, when we talk about the over 75s, remember this is households. Any household with one or more people aged over 75, regardless of household size or income, there could be three investment bankers you know, in that household plus one of the grannies. Okay? So this is incredibly badly targeted. So num task number two is communicate to the public what's really going on and what the consequences will be. And I think that the government is actually playing with fire in a way that the bank benches are fairly aware of. Actually, Witto is aware of it as well. Okay, he's very right-wing, but he does actually know quite a lot about, he knows a lot about the industry. And as a sort of devout Thatcherite, he also follows what Thatcher did about advertising, which she did appoint a right-wing economist and various other people, and she did follow the recommendation. And that leads into my third action, which is rather than doing the circling the wagons thing and trying to defend the license fee, which is increasingly indefensible, you say, okay, let's have a proper review of the long-term funding options. We've got the license fee until 2027, unless we agree with you, because it's it can be part of the, you know, the, the, the Privy Council will back us if we agree a new funding method. Let's have a proper review. Let's look at advertising. Let's look at uh, the German system. Let's look at subscriptions. Let's look at mixed funding, which I think is a no-no as well. And I think the BBC should be much more confident about the results of that. So those are my three actions. David, yeah, uh, are you applying this time? Um, well, I'm told I can't be selected unless I apply, so I've chosen not to apply. Uh, last time I applied for a job at the BBC, it was for chairman, and I wasn't interviewed, which was very sad. Um, maybe they'll change their mind this time. Much more interesting. There's an interview about that, but we won't have... All right, you're now, but you are now DG in this mythical world. You're standing up. What are you going to say? Three key things. I'm going to say two key things. Uh, one is, uh, I will quote uh, a famous rule of the world, uh, gunfire to the right of me, gunfire to the left of mm. me, excellent, forward. Mm. And the other is to quote from one of the BBC's most precious creations, uh, Private Jones, don't panic. <laughs> <laughs> All these things are manageable. Mm. Cool, calm consideration will get you through most crises. The Tory party will be doing its thing, but what Paddy says is quite right. Lay out the issues, have a proper open public discussion, mm. leave everything on the table. There's, there are no red lines. Mm. Let's work out what's best for public service broadcasting, mm. and at the same time, what's best for the way we run the BBC. Mm. And Alice, uh, you first of all start off by saying, uh, I'm the first female DG and about time too. <laughs> and then what do you say? Right, okay, well, I do think that, you know, go back to studying the shift, but I also think that we need to be thinking about the word independence. If I was the next DG, I would start by saying that I treasure the BBC and its independence, and I would seek to leverage that independence to an extent that has previously not been perceptible. Because I think this is really fundamentally an issue about our BBC versus their BBC. And I think, you know, you know we can all shirk it and dress it up and process it and, you know, have these daft consultations from DCMS where you're supposed to check, yes, do you, do you agree it's wrong to put people in jail? Of course I do. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. And, you know, that's what we're getting now is these pathetic processes that are, 
you know, whatever. They're, they're dressed up to create predetermined outcomes. So if I was the next DJ, I would definitely say that I would explore the independence because, you know, some of these alternative funding mechanisms will give the BBC an independence. And that's an interesting idea to pursue. Well, thank you very much. I, um, I'd, uh, we've got, I'd love to go on, but we've got on for longer. No. Thank you very much for not leaving. <laughs> Thank you very much for being so attentive and for the questions. I want to apologise to the panel for railroading them a little bit, but thank them. For me, it's been a considerable education. So uh, I'd like to clap other people too.